Hello everyone, welcome to the next seminar series. We will start in about a minute time with our guest. And please be patient, we, let, we wait until uh, everyone has joined the room. So we will start in about a minute time. Thank you. So people are slowly joining. Uh, again, for those which have just joined, we will start in about 30, 40 second time. We will let our colleague to join uh, the Zoom meeting and we will start in, I think, soon. All right, I can say then officially welcome everyone uh, to the Nexus seminar series. My name is Serena Cauchy. I'm here with Samanti Silva, our partner at TU Dresden, to welcome you to the, uh, the lecture where Professor or oh, Assistant Professor Jean Henri El Achar will speak a name on behalf of the Australian University here in Kuwait. And it's our great honor to having had him also previously at UNU Flores. And I'm really looking forward to the lecture, which is on sustaining biomass management practice through the resource nexus. Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Serena, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. So I will be giving like a presentation titled Sustaining Biomass Management Practices Through the Resource uh, Nexus. So I think we all uh, agree now that we are facing some issues on international level and we can all feel the effect of climate change that is affecting every one of us in all countries, developing countries, developed countries. So it's affecting us on different levels, the economic, environmental, medical. And as it was stated before, we are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change. And we are the last one who can do something about it. So recently, in summer 22, I think that we all uh, felt the increase in temperature worldwide. So in some regions, as you can see here in this uh, first picture, we had like increase up to eight degrees Celsius. I spent my summer at 22 in Germany, and I remember that we reached sometime like 40 degrees Celsius and maybe even more. So it's, it's like unusual records. And if we like uh, can see here from 1880 till 2020, we had like a global average temperature increase of 0 0.91 degrees Celsius. So it's something really alarming and we need to act in order to solve this issue. There, there are many, uh, let's say reasons for climate change. And one of those reasons is related to the improper waste management, or let's say uncontrolled waste management or biomass management. So biomass or waste, if it's not well managed, it can, let's say, generate what we call greenhouse gases emissions. If they are burned, can they can also be like fermented and generate CH4. So those gases will have like direct and harmful effect on the environment, which will directly uh, accelerate, let's say, the effects of climate change. And here you can see a picture from my country, from Lebanon, 
where we were facing like a waste crisis that started like 10 years ago. And unfortunately, it's still ongoing so far. So waste management, as uh, you can see in here, the world generates like billion tons of municipal solid waste annually. And we can say that at least 60% of them are non-valorized or let's say, or none even managed in an environmentally uh, friendly manner. If we talk about the trends of waste management, we can notice that we have an expected growth up to 3.4 billion tons of waste generated by 2050 in all countries, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe. So there is an exponential trend uh, of the increase in waste generation. If we have a look at the characteristics of such waste, we can notice that around 50% of those waste are considered as organic waste. In parallel or along papers, metals, plastics, glass, and others. So since we are talking about organic waste, which is the majority of waste produced, here we can also talk about biomass. So for me, and it's well known that organic waste is similar to what we call biomass. And we can have that there are different sources of biomass, such as the agricultural crops and residues. We have the sewage or also wastewater. We can talk about municipal solid waste. We have the animal residues, industrial residues, and we have also the forestry crops and residues. So what to do with such a waste, or let's say how to manage such a waste? The best scenario, of course, it will be to increase the quantity of, I mean, sorry, to decrease and to limit the quantity of waste generation. And of course, we can try to recover or to add value to such a waste via its conversion, for example, to green energy, renewable energy, mainly to what we call bioenergy. So, in this lecture today, I will be mainly talking about how we can manage organic waste or biomass and convert it to a source of renewable energy, which is called bioenergy. So this can be done uh, via the anaerobic digestion technology. So the anaerobic digestion technology is a process where we can collect different kinds of organic waste or biomasses, such as manure, wastewater biosolids, food waste, and also other organics such as energy crops, crop residues, uh, oils, etc. So we need to collect all those waste and you will put them in what we call a reactor or a digester under specific conditions. I mean, temperature, uh, specific, let's say, nutrient that, that should be there. And of course, I'm talking about specific type of microorganisms. So when I put those waste into a digester, we can have the production of two types of product. First, we have the gaseous product, which is called biogas, which is like methane and CO2. We have 60% of methane and around 40% of CO2. So this biogas will be used to generate electricity, heat, and it will be like a substitute for renewable natural gas. On the other hand, we can have the production of a solid byproduct, as you can see here, which is called the digestate. Digestate can be used as organic fertilizer, animal bedding, and also the liquid part of this digestate can be used for crop irrigation. When I'm talking about anaerobic digestion, one should note that it's like four different uh, steps and it's like conducted by specific type of microorganisms. So we need to convert the complex matter and biomass to what we call soluble molecule, so hydrolysis. Then we have the acidogenesis, which will produce volatile fatty acid. Then we have the acetogenesis. In the end, the acetic acids and H2 and CO2 will be converted to methane and CO2 through the methanogenesis, 
which will produce finally the biogas. So since we are talking about the anaerobic digestion, one should also mention the optimal conditions for such a technology. One, we need to have an optimal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, which is the optimal temperature for our microorganisms. We need also to have a neutral pH between 6.8 and 7.6. We need to have a continuous agitation of the reactor in order to ensure the best and optimal contact between our microorganisms and the waste or substrate itself. We need, of course, an environment with no oxygen, with the absence of oxygen, since we are dealing with anaerobic microorganisms. And of course, we can, in the end, uh, increase the methane production. And let's say this can lead to the success of our process, along with other parameters that should be taken into consideration, like the carbon content, nitrogen content, acidity, etc. So I divided my presentation into different parts, and I, I will start each part with a question. So the first question for today is, could organic waste or organic biomass be a source of bioenergy through anaerobic digestion, tackling at the same time biomass management and renewable energy production? So here I will tell you like my story that started around 10 years ago. 10 years ago, as I, I have uh, mentioned before, we were like in Lebanon facing this waste crisis. So we have decided, we are scientists, we are engineers, let's try to solve this issue. So before going into details, I want to here just show you what I'm actually doing, because, you know, as a bioprocess engineer, as a professor at the university, we have our own labs. And for anaerobic digestion, we are, let's say, we need at first to collect what we call the inoculum or the microorganisms. As you can see here, it's like from cow manure. It's our treasure. It's the source of, uh, let's say, it's the main actor that will convert waste into bioenergy. So we are dealing also with batch reactors. We can also deal with what we call semi-continuous reactors. And at the same time, in the end, we will be working with continuous reactors. And our experiments take too much time. They are long experiments. They are really critical because, of course, we are dealing with like uh, living microorganisms that are, let's say, very picky. And we need to stick to the optimal conditions all the time. So let's get back to my story. As I mentioned, I started like 10 years ago. So we mentioned we had the idea to do something for Lebanon. So that's why we proposed uh, my PhD, or let's say we, we shared our PhD, my PhD proposal with France to one of the universities there. And we did my PhD in collaboration between St. Joseph University in Beirut and the University of South Britain. So we've decided in the beginning to focus on one kind of waste. It's really hard to take the waste bin and do experiments. We need to focus at something at the beginning. That's why we decided to work on grape waste. Why grape? Because, you know, in Lebanon, we have like a tight relationship and a very historical relationship between grapes, winemaking, and the country itself. So this started like 3,000 years ago with the Phoenicians, then with the miracle of Jesus Christ. And until nowadays, the cultivation of grapes is very famous in the country. And we have a huge production of grape waste, around 8,000 tons per year. So similarly in France, you know that one of the main uh, producers of grapes worldwide, we have around 700 thousands tons of grape pumice or grape waste that it's produced on a yearly basis. And the majority of such waste is not valorized. So what kind of waste I'm talking about? You know, when we, are, we need to process the grape waste to produce like wine, grape juice, jelly, grape seed extract, vinegar, and grape seed oil, we will have a solid waste that remains in the end. And this is what you can see here in this picture. This is called the grape pumice, which contains skin, pulps, and seeds. 
So here we started this project, let's say, we took the grape pumice or the grape waste, and we did some experiment on a batch scale reactor. Then we did like an extrapolation to a continuous one. And we proved that our, let's say, waste or biomass can be a good potential to produce electricity. I want to just recap this project and give you like the, uh, the final fruit of this project, if you can say. So we have demonstrated that one ton of grape pumice or GP or grape waste can produce around 250 meter cube of methane. Just to give you a better idea, one meter cube of methane is equivalent to one liter of mazout, is equivalent to 10 kilowatt hour electricity, to one kilogram of 1.3 kilogram of coil, 0.94 meter cube of natural gas, and 1.15 liter of gasoline. So here we can feel the great value of turning such a waste into a source of renewable energy. Then I continued this uh, research. And you know, so now the question is, what is the relation between the composition of the biomass or the composition of the waste and the methane production? That's why, as you can see here, we have collected different varieties of grape waste from uh, Bordeaux in France, from Champagne, also in France, from the Bicard Valley. It's one of the main producing uh, grapes in Lebanon and from Pays de la Loire in France. So those are the main uh, regions for grapes cultivation. So we had nine different varieties. At the first step, we have decided to assess the methane production and to see, to tell you honestly, I thought that methane production will be the same because we are dealing with the same substrate. It's in the end, great waste. However, as you can see in here, I was literally surprised because the methane production differs significantly from a type to another. And you can see the difference in the production. So, of course, we uh, we like try to explain why we have this variance, and we can and we determine that it's due to the difference in the biodegradable components that are present in such a waste. For example, you have a grape with more quantity of sugar. So this more quantity of sugar will generate a higher quantity of methane. So I conducted what we call a principal component analysis, only PCA, it's like a statistical matrix. And we were able to explain around 95% of the total data variance. So now we know that, for example, the presence of what we call in biochemistry, cellulose, lignin, total solids, will be like, will inhibit methane production. However, the presence of soluble compounds like hemicellulose and sugars will increase uh, methane production. So the next step in our project, you know, as bioprocess engineers and as engineers in general, our main goal is to optimize processes, is to increase the income. Uh, that's why our target was to maximize the methane production from our waste, or let's say to increase the potential of methane production. That's why I tested different kinds of pretreatments prior to the anaerobic digestion. I tried like chemical pretreatments, physical pretreatments such as pulsed electric fields, ultrasounds, freezing, and other kinds of pretreatment. So Long story short, I just want to tell you that we succeeded to increase the methane production from our biomass by around 68%, which is something very promising, and it was considered as a great result. So we combined the freezing plus alkaline treatment, and we increased methane by 70%, as you can see here in this table. So concerning this project of grape waste, our last part was to, let's say, 
optimize the process and to do like a scale up from a lab scale to an industrial scale. That's why we conducted many kinds of experiment and we determined in the end that the hydraulic retention time or the best retention time for the reactor should be, for example, 20 days and the loading rate, let's say, or the input itself should be around 3.7 kilogram per meter cube per day. So now it's like a transition from the lab scale results to an industrial scale result. So this was concerning the grape waste. After my PhD also, I, I would love to show you some of the other results. I focused on other byproducts that are produced in the Mediterranean area, so near my country, Lebanon. That's why in a, in a different project, we decided to focus on olive waste. Why olive waste? Because you know olive trees have been grown around the Mediterranean since the eighth millennium before Christ. We have Spain as the largest producer of olive oil, followed by Italy, Greece, and Tunisia. And of course, Lebanon is one of the main uh, olive oil producing. So since we are talking about olive oil production, we have in the end the solid residue that remains or what we call the olive pumice or the olive waste. I've conducted several experiments and I just wanna show you the final result, which proved that around 120 meter cube of methane can be produced from one ton of olive pumice. So you can imagine now the advantage that uh, this can bring to any refinery so we can decrease the cost of energy needed so we can be talking about more sustainable cultivation and more sustainable olive oil production. So just to finish with the organic waste, I've also tested different kinds of biomasses. Uh, I won't be sharing all results, but just to give you an idea, we have proved also that daily waste, like what we call here the lactoserum, it's produced from daily industries. We have the wheat, crops, wheat waste, uh, microalgae also, olive of course, food waste in general, and coffee. You know, we drink coffee to have energy boost. And I can tell you that coffee can produce a huge amount of biomethane, and this was proven in one of our projects. So yes, of course, biomass or organic waste can be turned or can be converted into what we call green energy or bioenergy through anaerobic digestion. Now let's move to a second question. It's all part of the biomass management. Now let's talk about wastewater sludge. So could wastewater sludge be a source of bioenergy through anaerobic digestion? In order to answer this question, I wanna share with you a current project that I'm working on with my colleagues at Ronelum One Institute in Berlin at the Freiburg University and the Technical University of Munich. So here we are trying to work on what we call uh, open modeling framework for integrated water, energy, food, and environment system. So we are trying to, let's say, to create an open model that can be used by anyone who's interested in the topic. So this will help us, let's say, to describe, to configure, and to simulate systems where we have integrated water, energy, food, and environment. So this is like an ongoing project. Now we have a paper which is under review. That's why I just mentioned here the title with the authors. Uh, so just to give you an idea, this OEP or this open modeling framework will follow a generic modular and time series based modeling approach to address challenges related to the water, energy, food, environment nexus for a better or sustainable infrastructure development. I won't go into the details of 
this model. However, I will show you, let's say, the case study that was highlighted or that will be hopefully highlighted in this published paper. So just to let you know that we have chosen to work on the wastewater treatment plant based in Lebanon in a city called However, such a sludge is not valorized. It's not treated. It's not well uh, managed. So as you can see in here, those are the results of my experimental uh, studies that I'm uh, doing. And here you can see in this column, the results that we obtained using our model that we created. So we were able, and a very simple, let's say, actions to determine the volume of the digester, the digestive flow rate, the organic flow rate, also the methane production, the electricity production, the heat production, and the energy demand. So here we can prove that this model that we are establishing could be very helpful in order to, uh, let's say, to avoid maybe some experimental part experimental part, I mean, and to just obtain some uh, accurate results. And it's worth noting here that we have uh, proved that using an aerobic digestion and this wastewater treatment plant, we can have an electrical energy recovery potential by 10%. So we can substitute 10% of the electricity, let's say, or the a fuel we are using to gen to let's say to run our uh, plant we can use we can let's say recover just 10 percent and use our uh, our biogas produced which will recover 10 percent of such electricity however this is not the this is not the ultimate result because in my study here in, in the experimental study we have proven that we have some pretreatments which increased the electrical recovery and it reached now 30%. So imagine we can substitute 30% of the fuel to run the wastewater treatment plant by the biogas, which is produced from the anaerobic digestion of the wastewater sludge. Here you can see like a summary of uh, the outcome of this model that we implemented. So long story short, we have we started with the primary pretreatment. As you can see in here, we will obtain the dewatered sludge. So this dewatered sludge will go to the anaerobic digester. Some of the slurry obtained will go to the dewatering unit. We will have an effluent which can go to the constructed wetland for irrigation, environment, and uh, etc. Or any use in the industry. After the anaerobic digestion, we will have as, as income the production of biogas. So this biogas with CO2 and methane, we need to do what we call desulfurization and decarbonization. So we will have pure methane production, which can be used for combined heat and power production. Can have electricity, heat, or both of them combined. So this is like the general idea of uh, this process. And I forget to tell here that you have also the digestate, which is the solid byproduct, which is produced and which can be used for, as let's say, organic fertilizer or livestock bedding for animals. In this project, also in this paper, we have tried to uh, draw the interactions between water, energy, food, and environment through, of course, the resource nexus. I just like, let's say, highlight maybe two of them. So the energy that will be produced by this process can be used to heat the digester, which will uh, reduce the energy cost on the plant itself. For example, what's the relation between energy and food? We have the biogas production, which can be used for agriculture machinery and also for cooking also. And it's uh, currently used in many countries. We have a great relation between water, 
food environment. So there are a lot of interactions that what one can mention following this resource nexus. Now, I will move to a third question, to another case study, to another example, of course, always using biomass. And now I will be talking about petroleum sludge. Now I'm living in Kuwait, and you know that Kuwait is one of the main oil and gas producing countries in the world. And those industries here, they are suffering from vast production of waste, which is the petroleum sludge. So can we convert it to anaerobic digestion? This project, well, just to tell you that, it was pre presented at the ADIPEG, which is the largest conference and exhibition on petroleum. It took place in Abu Dhabi. So uh, we presented our project and we published also a paper in ADIPEG. So just to let you know, petroleum sludge is produced during the exploration, production, and refining of crude oil. In this petroleum sludge, we have many toxic components. We have also oil, grease, organic chemicals, such as benzene, toluene, xylene, phenolics, and others. Here you can see petroleum sludge, which is discharged in open ponds here in the desert. So of course, it's not the best practice in order to manage such a waste. As I mentioned, petroleum sludge has severe effects on the environment, on human health. It's carcinogenic, it's cytogenic, methanogenic, it causes cancer uh, and many other diseases. So we need to find the appropriate solution to sustainably manage such a biomass. I tried to do so using my technology, with, which is the anaerobic digestion. One need to admit that it's not common to treat petroleum sludge using anaerobic digestion technology. Why? Because petroleum sludge is a very complex, or let's say it has a very complex structure. So it needs a long time to be degraded by the microorganisms. And here, if you are, I wanna talk about the hydraulic retention time for our digester, it might definitely exceed 30. To overcome this issue, we have a solution, which is to do some kind of pretreatments. Pretreatments, they will be done on the, uh, solid waste itself. We can do like what we call ozone pretreatment, ultrasonication, biological pretreatment, thermal pretreatment, ozone pretreatment, etc. So why those pretreatments? Because using those pretreatments, we can solubilize the uh, petroleum sludge, or we can, let's say, help the microorganisms to better degrade and better convert this biomass to bioenergy. However, it's not the best solution so far. My proposition would be to combine petroleum sludge treatment with food waste treatment. Why we need to combine both of them? Because as I mentioned, sludge have very poor anaerobic biodegradability. We have huge concentrations of heavy metals that might stop or block the activity of anaerobic digestion. So when I'm using co-digestion, which means the addition of food waste into petroleum sludge, I can achieve much better and positive outcomes. How I can achieve such outcomes? Because my toxic components or my heavy metals will be diluted. In addition, I will be adding some kind of micronutrient that will help my microorganisms to degrade such biomass. I can also be well managing the moisture in the reactor. So the best and optimal solution, 
that was pre presented at uh, the Adibic conference was the combination of petroleum sludge plus food waste. As you can see in here, in this circular model we have prepared, so we would recommend to collect the petroleum sludge generated from the oil and gas industry. For example, this can be implemented in the city in Kuwait or any city that where we have like oil and gas production, along with the transport of food waste from cities, uh, crops and residues, manure, wastewater or sewage sludge. This will be transported into a central digester. In this digester, microorganisms will play their role and they will convert those biomasses into biogas. This biogas can be used to power uh, some houses, some, let's say, or part of some industries, we can also go further and remove the CO2 from the biogas. And in this case, you will opt to obtain the biomethane, which can be used as transportation fuel, can be used for heating, for electricity. And of course, in order to have a circular model to close the petroleum sludge loop, we need to include renewable energy sources such as wind energy and solar energy, since we have like uh, around 320 or more sunny days in uh, Kuwait, for example. So we can combine renewable energy, which will try, let's say, to uh, uh, increase, sorry, to decrease the energy load on our digester in a more sustainable and greener way. So with this slide, I will be ending this part related to petroleum sludge. I know I still have to talk about the policy recommendations for this part. Uh, everyone working with petroleum sludge and mainly its conversion to bioenergy should, should consider treatment costs, uh, the environmental regulations, the resource recovery, and also the sludge characteristics. And since we are talking about adding food waste, and we all know that food waste consumption differ from a country to another. So we need to know what is the characteristics of my waste that is introduced in order to uh, assess the practicality of implementing such a plan on a national level. And everyone, private investors and government are urged to participate nowadays and anaerobic digestion projects. In the end, I will move to the last case study or project. And I would like to inform you and to tell you that this project is being done in collaboration with the United Nations Flores University with my colleague Serena. I initiated this project when I was a visiting scholar at Flores in summer 2022. And hopefully we will uh, elaborate more on this project and we will do much more uh, activities in this regard. So could petroleum produced water be a bioenergy source through anaerobic digestion? At the beginning, let me tell you what is the produced water or petroleum produced water. It's one of the significant industrial waste streams in the world. It's produced from the exploration and extraction of oil and gas resources. We have around 250 million barrels of produced water that are produced daily. And around 40% are discharged into the environment without any treatment and without any valorization. So managing and adding value to produced water is essential today, and it's a must for the oil and gas industry worldwide. While, why produced water is considered as uh, toxic, why we need to treat it? Because we have different types of organic and inorganic compounds, and also toxic compounds like 
solvents, we have many chemical additives, we have uh, heavy metals, and we have what we call the petroleum hydrocarbon content, which will have direct and harmful effects on the ecosystem and human health. So, what are the barriers that will prevent industries today from using such produced water? First, one can say that the cost of, of using produced water is significantly higher than the cost of using fresh water because definitely we need to treat it. We have huge variations in the quantity of produced water affluent. We have very low produced water quality. And indeed, we have a lack of effective and adequate produced water management policy. So produced water, if you can talk about it, the solutions now, we can use it for municipal use, uh, for flashing, etc. We can use it for groundwater recharge, for hydraulic fracturing, for irrigation. Of course, I'm talking about uh, in a, it's prior, it's before, it's after, sorry, treating such water. We cannot use it for irrigation directly. So there are many, many possibilities. Here, one can mention the wetlands. You know, the wetlands through the plants or wood, I'm talking about constructed wetlands, of course, we can uh, decrease the toxicity of such produced water. For example, here you can see we have the influent, which is the petroleum produced water. We can have what we call phyto extraction, uh, phyto volatilization, microbial degr degradation. We can uh, decrease the quantities of persistent organic pollutants or POPs, even heavy metals via absorption. And we will have an affluent, which is less concentrated in heavy metals which is a cleaner and which can be used in many industrial applications in a safe uh, manner. Since we are talking about produced water, I would like to share with you this example of one of the world's largest constructed wetland facilities for treating produced water. It's located in Oman. As you can see here in the picture, we have around 17,500,000 1, meter cube of produced water per day. They are collected from a neighboring oil field using a space of 490 hectares of wetland. Studies show that energy required to run this facility is more than 29% less than the energy needed for deep well disposal sites. We can have, can achieve a net zero carbon footprint. Uh, observations demonstrated that this ecosystem or this constructed wetland for produced water attracted more than 130 bird species throughout the migratory seasons in Oman. And we can notice like the cooling effect on the environment and the impact of such a technology on the local microclimate. So the temperature of the surroundings were lower uh, after, let's say, implementing such a process. As you can see here, the uh, model, circular model, to close the loop of produced water. So instead of using produced water in, uh, for deep well disposal, we can drain this produced water to what we call the constructed wetlands. As we can see here, it will offer us many ecosystem services like microclimate regulation. It will be considered as a habitat and ecosystem. It will help to create what we call 
a new ecosystem. From this constructed wetland, we will have our affluent, which is cleaner. So this treated affluent can be used for aquaculture. So here we are adding value. We are creating a market value. We can also use it for biosaline agriculture or plants that will that can, let's say, uh, tolerate uh, high concentration of salts. And we can move further and do like desalination for such produced water with the support of some kind of renewable energy. And the outcome, the clear desalinated water can be in this case used for traditional agriculture and for hydroponics. On the other side, you know that for the constructed wetlands, we have also the production of biomass. So with this biomass, we can also close the material cycle and we, and we can like valorize it while converting it to biogas through anaerobic digestion, where the heat produced can be used, for example, in many offices and surrounding houses. And also in parallel, we can use this biomass and produce compost uh, through composting, which was also like a fertilizer, which will help the agricultural uh, system and the country and, and the community itself. So yes, there are many sustainable solutions and green solutions to treat produced water. In order to close this part with some recommendations that you have obtained so far. Uh, we need to encourage produced water recycling or valorizing, valorization through economic incentives via tax policy changes. We need also to develop different modeling tools to calculate and compare the environmental effect, the hazards, prices, and other features of using produced water versus other kind of water sources. You know, now we have uh, a lack in the reporting concerning produced water. We don't know exactly what is the quantity generated. So we need to have a uniform reporting on such a biomass. So we need to have robust and reliable data that will help the legislation and which that, that should help the industry to standardize produced water uh, reporting. We would also recommend to have a good coordination uh, across the oil and gas companies, the state, the organizations, and the work group with the main aim of exchanging experience, uh, knowledge, and of course, to homogenize policies as much as possible. And as in all our environmental projects, we need to raise awareness, we need to communicate, and educate the public and end users, stakeholders about the potential benefits of using produced water or any non fresh water sources for good in order to create and add value. So now I will reach the end of my presentation. And as I wrote in here, to move the needle, we need to support a regulatory framework. We need to have continuous effort from all stakeholders and industries in order to make a beneficial reuse of all biomasses in general. I'm talking about organic waste, organic biomass, wastewater, like produced water, petroleum sludge, or any other kind of uh, waste produced. There are many factors that we should consider. And as I always say in my presentations, waste management, it's not about the uh, waste itself. It's about people. So we need to change uh, the way we uh, see such a waste. Instead of seeing a waste, let's try to turn it into a gold. Let's try to give it 
a value because uh, we need to capitalize and to use the opportunities that biomass may offer. And indeed, the answer lies before us. Uh, before closing, I would like to thank all my partners and colleagues that contributed to my research projects uh, and case studies during the past 10 years. And I would like to thank you everyone for your attention and for joining us today. And I would be glad to hear uh, your feedback and of course to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean, for this very comprehensive uh, excursus, actually, into the waste world. I think this has been uh, a great pleasure to hear. And I will open now the floor for question and answer, which I also recommend to all our colleagues. In case you have any question, please place it in the Q&A section. And in case uh, also, I would like to give also to the floor first to Samanti, if she wants to say a couple of words or I have a question, then I will open the floor from our participants. Thank you, Serena. Um, not a question per se, but it was just such a wonderful ending with the, with the two, with the, the value and the gold um, in the waste that I thought was very insightful and, and brought the, your presentation to a, to a nice, um, well, tipping point in a way <laughs> as well. But um, I want to leave the floor for the questions for the participants. So Serena, over to you. All right, so I would start with the question from the audience and then I have a couple myself too. So first question comes from our director. So the vision, my vision of circular economy is that we look into technological feasibility and then we develop a business model. One way of doing this could be applying material flows cost accounting. Did you apply this in your economic method already or any other economic evaluation? Uh, thank you, Serena. Thank you so much, Professor Idel, for your uh, question. Indeed, it's uh, very critical. And, you know, to treat uh, waste in general, we can adopt different technologies. So in order to choose what is the best technology, we need to consider different factors. And one of the factors is the uh, economic uh, factor. Just to let you know that uh, currently we are doing uh, an economic, a detailed economic study in order, let's say, to help an industry in Lebanon implement a digester treating wastewater sludge in order to help them convert it to bioenergy. So we are indeed, as you mentioned, considering the cost of the materials because we have many heavy materials and equipment that need to be used. We need to consider the transportation of the material itself. So the location of the digester, the average temperature in the city, if I need heat, if I need cooling. So we are now doing a current study and we are considering all of those parameters. And in the end, we will end with like recommendations. What is my net present value? What is the uh, payback period for my project? and uh, of course the capex opex so this is a vital part in order to build the business model for any kind of valorization for any kind of waste valorization so indeed maybe when i have the final result maybe i can share it with you so you can see the effect of economics on implementing such techniques thank you so much thank you jean i think there will be more food for thoughts and here i see also uh, congratulations from the audience as well for your speech. Thank you. Our next question is uh, about retrieving or recovering nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium from grape or olive waste or from the wastewater before sending it to the anaerobic digester. So what is your opinion? I'm trying to uh, 
interpret what is your opinion about the possibility of doing also nutrient recovery before the digestion uh, process or uh, have you thought about it? Are there any study on that level? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your question. Uh, it's a very important one. I will try to answer it uh, giving some examples. You know, in order to retrieve nutrients such as uh, potassium uh, or any other NPK, you know, it's difficult to do so. Why? Because those nutrients are uh, a must. Uh, they are needed by the microorganisms because without those nutrients, microorganisms won't be active and won't be able to degrade my biomass or my waste. However, there are other kinds of molecules that we can extract from the biomass and which are really amazing and very useful nowadays. I will give you an example. We have the polyphenols. Polyphenols, they are uh, present in olive pomace, uh, sorry, I mean in the grape pomace itself and in all kinds of fruits, in the orange peel, in the avocado. So before taking those waste into the anaerobic digestion, now we are applying different kinds of green extraction technologies using green solvent, where we are extracting those polyphenols and we are using them in the cosmetic and medical fields because they have antioxidant properties. So indeed, we have like many valuable products that we need to extract and use. One of them is the polyphenols, which is classified into different categories. So we have different kinds of polyphenols or essential oils. This will be extracted, will be valorized, and the remaining part of the biomass, which won't be useful, it will be converted into bioenergy. So I hope I answered or I gave you some uh, I, I think this was a very thorough answer. I want to add maybe something else that is also related to energy consumption to also uh, retrieve, because even if the amount of nutrient might be larger uh, or in higher amount than the one needed for being processed by the microorganism, this is also as a cost, which is So we have to see uh, management actually of waste. So I think I couldn't hear you, Serena. Is it the same? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I just realized it now. Can you up. hear me now? Yes. Now it's better, maybe. Yeah. Apologies. So I just want to say that we have to think of which is the management that we want to apply. And if we want to use multiple one, we have to see at the trade-offs that also in terms of energy costs that uh, would apply because recovering uh, nutrients, it has also a cost. So even if we have a larger amount of nutrients that what we should be you know, having for the digestion process, we have to see whether this is worth or which is the priority at the moment for the area. Um, exactly. Just, just a note from my side. Uh, but That's why we need to do the LCA. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that will be the next plan I had. Um, yes, any other question from the audience? If not, I have one. Please. Which deals with... Uh, materials so constancy in material uh, for waste transformed into energy uh, so agricultural production has a higher uh, variety variation and also seasonal based uh, approach so how do you plan or how the pilot scale that you have been investigating uh, is planning to maintain this type of uh, energy production or uh, strategy to cope with the yearly uh, intake or need of energy. Over. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Serena. And thanks to the storage rooms we have. <laughs> because, you know, we need to, uh, as you mentioned, we have the season's effect on uh, biomass production. This That will affect directly the gas generation 
from the reactor. That's how at first we need, we can think about storage. So we can store our biomass and uh, we can like use it uh, when needed because you know, for the reactor, we need to specify, we need to have a specific loading rate. For example, we need to have an input of let's say one ton per meter cube per day. So I need to stick to this load in order to reach a steady state of energy production. So this can be done, one, while we can store our biomass, two, we, we can talk about co-digestion. So let's say now if it's the seasons of tomatoes, perfect, I can use tomatoes waste. And the next, if it's like uh, apple, we can substitute tomatoes with the apple waste. You know what I mean? The digester will run using multiple kinds of waste. That's why the importance of having co-digestion and not to have a monodigestion, or let's say having a reactor relying just on grape waste. That's not doable on the long term. So we need to have a variety. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Maybe I connect to his last question, which is related to the logistics, because of course, uh, moving and transportation, it has also high impact in terms of costs. Uh, when it comes to uh, storage is also a cost itself, but also transportation from one agricultural area to another one. So how do, envi do you envision actually the partnership uh, within the agricultural regions um, that doesn't apply for petroleum, but I think this there will be more question. I think I see more question in the in the chat. How how do you uh, do your business model now? To, uh, turning back uh, to the initial question uh, for making that also sustainable, where also transportation might not account as a, one of the highest costs as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. So if you remember, Serena, the slide I put for petroleum sludge and food waste. So one of the main conditions is to think about the location of the digester itself. And if you want to have a centralized digester or decentralized digester, because it's it really makes a difference. So the best scenario would be, as I mentioned, to talk about co-digestion, to treat different kinds of waste, and this will be in partnership, of course, with the uh, industry itself and with other cooperatives, maybe the municipality, because here, for example, in Kuwait or in Beirut, the municipality should be included because they have the role to collect such a waste. You know, and it's like, uh, it's not a simple uh, process to be followed and many uh, partners should take part in order to have a successful outcome in the end, like transportation, location. Uh, yeah, there are many things that needs to be considered. Thank you. That was just a peep preview as I see that you are already full hands on it. Um, last <laughs> question that comes from the audience. And it's twice, both in the Q&A and in the chat. So it's how does this project, I believe, co-digestion process affect the CO2 impact or the CO2 emissions and how that might help to reduce CO2 or not? So yeah. I think this is a question that we had you know, Serena, the two of us. <laughs> this question is very tricky because <laughs> it's... Uh, it was written by one of my students. And I, I told them that I might ask you some questions in your final. And this one is a very potential question to be asked, but <laughs> I will try to answer it. Of course, we will have like uh, effect on CO2 because instead of keeping waste uh, fermented in open landfills or in the open air, here we are making control of the gases emissions. You know, so we will have like, let's say production of CH4 and uh, CO2 mainly, methane and CO2. As I mentioned, methane will be used for heat, electricity, etc. However, for the CO2, we have many green ways to use it now. For example, we can uh, give the CO2 that we extract to microalgae because those microalgae would need CO2 to grow. 
So we can offer them the CO2 and those microalgae will give us like many bioactive molecules, will give us like biofuels. So we need to think about it in a very sustainable and in a complete scheme. So yes, we can uh, decrease at first greenhouse gases emissions. We can better control the generation of gases. We can reduce CO2 and CH4 while making use of them. Thank you, and I'm sure that also with your LCA analysis, you will deepen also the understanding between the initial production up to the so. transformation processes. I hope so. Okay, that said, any other questions from the audience? Comments? If this is not the case, as I see, I will take the chance actually to thank you, Jeanne, uh, for your uh, very engaging lecture. I think it has been a pleasure to listen to it. And uh, this shows that circularity can also lead uh, to sustainability processes, but also to engage with very uh, challenging topic like the waste, where the is, uh, waste is a human-made actually outcome, but is also uh, can be also seen it as acting for a uh, more uh, nexus approach in terms of natural resource management and how resources can either return or be optimized uh, in nature and in man-made uh, environments. So I think that was uh, very uh, highlighting. That said, uh, I would close this uh, nexus seminar and inviting you in a month time to a, the next Nexus seminar. And um, I'm looking forward then to see you all for the Nexus seminar in 65, if I'm not wrong. And uh, Samanti, if you want to say a couple of words to the next speaker, I think uh, that would be good for our Yes, visitors. happily. So um, in, on January 16th, um, Ilka Weisbrot will be joining us. Ilka has uh, experience in both practice and research. So um, he's working at an innovation uh, agency and she's a postdoc and doing research on um, sustainability in the business context. So her topic will be learning to further sustainability oriented innovation in business from outside and within. Um, so you're all very much invited. I shared the link in the chat so you can register for the next session and be, be informed. Um, but I also wanted to use the opportunity to say thank you for this wonderful year in 2022 because the next session will be in 2023. Um, so I hope you'll have a nice break. Um, Serena, now you're back. You were breaking up briefly, I think. <laughs> So yes. over to you for the I final. I think speech. you can just close and wishing you all a very good end of the year. And we will resume again, as uh, Samanti said, uh, after the winter holidays and in the new year. Thanks again to Jean. And uh, yes. we do look forward for the updates on your, uh, you know, implementation scale of code yes, so in <laughs> Lebanon. Thank you, Thank you everyone, so much, everyone and have a great afternoon, morning or evening wherever you are sitting and take good care. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.